see you here uh, this morning. Uh, let's pray and we will get to work. God, it is um, an overwhelming thought when we consider that we have access to you, to your throne room, holy, almighty God, that we have access because of Jesus. And it's not the kind of access that's like, it's okay if you're here. It's, you tell us to come in boldly, confidently before the throne of grace. That is an overwhelming thought. I pray that you would bring that to bear this morning. That those who know you would have a renewed sort of energized perspective on the gospel of Jesus that those who wouldn't answer in the affirmative if they were asked if they are Christians or know God, they, God, I pray that you would make yourself known. God, there's a work that needs done this morning in the hearts of men and women, and it's a work that um, only you can do. So by your Holy Spirit, would you move? Would you do that work? Would you find us faithful in the things that you've asked us to do? And would you remain faithful in the things that only you can do? In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Which version of you did Jesus come to save? Which version of you did Jesus come to save? The, the best version of you? The, the one all dressed up and ready for pictures, the best foot forward version of you? The one maybe in the highlight reel or the one on Snapchat or Instagram or wherever we post things we're proud of? Is it that one? Or is it the real you? And you know the one. <laughs> Right. It's the one who shows up when no one's watching. It's the one who shows up when the doors are shut and the windows are closed. Which version of you, of me, did he come to save? This one, the real you, the real me, here's a list from Scripture. The liar, the cheat, the greedy, the profane, the addict, the thief, the gossip, the ungrateful, the sexually immoral, the slanderer, the malicious, the hater, the bigot, the fool, the murderer, the impatient, the selfish, the prideful, the disobedient, the lover of self, etc., etc. The list is long. That one. Which one did Jesus come to save? You know one of the reasons why I believe the Bible is true, and there are lots of reasons why I believe the Bible is true. This is just one of them. It's a good one. Because it doesn't dress the story up before it tells it. I mean, if you were to think about it, if, if, if the message of the Bible was, was made up, like if it was nothing more than political or social propaganda designed to, you know, manipulate the masses, that is, as it is often accused of being, if it is that, then it's really poorly done. Particularly as relates to the patriarchs, the founders. <laughs> because it tells their truth. And it doesn't look good. Propaganda, we tend to dress up our founders. 
And scripture doesn't do that. <laughs> it tells the ugly truth, and I mean the whole ugly truth. It doesn't sugarcoat it. It doesn't smooth it over. It doesn't dress it up. It doesn't shy away from it. If you, when you look at the world in here, looks an awful lot like the world we see out there. Or, to get uncomfortable, the world we see where? In here. That's a testament of the truthfulness of Scripture. If, if we opened it up, and on every page, the people looked amazing. Their homes are well-trimmed, and the picket fences, and the, the sweetness, the aroma, the rainbows, the unicorns, the butterflies. We wouldn't believe it. Here's the truth, the ugly truth. And this is just a small sampling. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was a liar. Jacob was a cheat. Moses, a murderer. King David, too, a murderer. Remember who he, who he murdered? The man of the woman he committed adultery with. And that's just a s small sampling. Whew. These are the ones that Jesus came to save. These are the people God set out to redeem. Look at, look at. When he went to the cross, it was not overkill. And just sit with that for a second. Not overkill. It was not excessive. Like, come on, God, for crying out loud, and you're making a mountain out of a molehill. Like, it was not that. It was right. It was necessary. It was justly proportionate to the offense. Justly apportionate, proportionate to the offense. Okay, or our offense. When Jesus came became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. John chapter 1 verse 14. When God stepped into humanity, John 3, 17, not to condemn it but to save it, he stepped into a, a real mess. And there isn't this sense as we've been studying through the book of Genesis like God had this plan to redeem us and oh, it just wasn't going right. So he's like, okay, fine. He knew Genesis chapter 3 by verse 15. He knew exactly what he was going to do to redeem us. He knew exactly who you were. He knew exactly who I was. And he knew what it would cost to redeem us. The only people who didn't know that well, are us. But he knew from the beginning, arguably before the foundations of the world, he knew exactly who we were. And it says, and God so loved. We don't have to dress it up. We don't have to sugarcoat it. We don't have to. The real you is the one he came for. The real you. Not the Instagram ready you. The real you. That's the one he had in mind when he set his face to Jerusalem. Many, many years ago. Okay. I'm going to say this a couple of times this morning. Scripture does not romanticize, nor does it sentimentalize the cross of Christ. It was as real and as bloody as the mess that Jesus stepped into. Justly proportionate to the offense. That says something about the God that we serve and worship. That says something about the Bible that we read. It says something about the gospel that we preach. And that says something about the mission that we're on. 
And I hope today amidst the mess, and it's messy, I hope you feel that invitation to come to, as we just sang, the altar. To, to truly believe that his ar arms are in fact open wide. Not because you got him fooled. But because he knew exactly who you were a long time ago. I hope you sense that invitation this morning. Now why did I take the time to do all this? Um, because the story today is about as ugly as it gets. It is hard to read. It is hard to preach. Like you, you look ahead and you see where we're going in our study and you get to Genesis chapter 34 and I, as a preacher I'm just going, well, what are we going to do with that? How are we going to deal with that? Here's the good news. I'm not going to wait for the conclusion for it today. We're going to need it through the story. So we're going to talk about the good news right now and then take that with us into the mess we're about to read. Here's the good news. If God is going to keep his promise to these people, if he's going to keep his promises to these people, the promises to bless them and through them to bless all the families of the earth, remember the one that's Genesis chapter uh, 12 that's, that goes on and repeats in 15, 17, and then again later and again this morning, that, those promises, is he, if he's going to keep those promises to these people, then the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is astonishingly merciful, loving, and kind. That can be the only uh, explanation. Unless you believe he's blind. Do you believe he's blind? No, I don't believe he's blind. So the only answer then is that he's astonishingly merciful, kind, loving. And the cross of Christ must be remarkably robust. What does that mean? Robust. Simple definition. I like definitions. Strong and healthy. And then this. Able to withstand or overcome. The cross must be robust. The title this morning is simple. The real you. That's it. Not some dressed up, Instagram ready version of you, the real you. So let's get to it. It's not easy. Genesis 34. If you are a guest with us this morning, we've been working over, over <laughs> actually a couple of years. We've done it in a couple of parts. We've been slowly working our way through the book of Genesis, and it has been uh, a delight, but it is certainly not easy. And today will be proof of that. I left off last week. Uh, in verse 17 of chapter 33 and on purpose because verse 18 sort of sets the scene, sets up what happens in chapter 34. So let's pick it up actually in 33 verse 18 and we'll catch up. Get a little bit of a running start. Look at this. And Jacob came safely, there's a footnote, it could mean peacefully, without harm. He came to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. On his way from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city. 18 reads uh, sort of as, as this sort of pivotal verse. It reads like a conclusion. It, it concludes a 20 year exile for Jacob. If you remember, 20 years ago, he left Canaan, he left the land of promise, and he went up to Padan Aram to, he was fleeing his brother, his brother, brother wanted to kill him. So he flees the country, and God promises to go with him and to bring him back. And so this sort of reads as, he's back. It reads kind of like a conclusion, although I'm not sure it is. I think it might be a pivot, maybe. I'm not sure it's a conclusion. Some argue that the, the sort of conclusion of the 20-year exile comes in chapter 35, verse 1, where it reads, where God comes to Jacob and he tells him, arise and go to Bethel and dwell there. Notice chapter 35 comes conveniently after chapter 34. Something happens in 34 and God's answer to it is get up and go to Bethel. So some argue that he should have been, he should have went to Bethel in the first place. We wouldn't have Genesis chapter 34. Thirty-four. 
their argument, I think, bears uh, some merit. Flip back a couple of pages to Genesis chapter 28. This is on the other side of that 20-year exile. He's on his way. He just left his homeland. He's fleeing for his life. He's out in the middle of nowhere with nothing but a walking stick. And he sort of uh, is lost and, and aiming his way north. It doesn't have anything. He's going to use a rock for a pillow, and he's going to have a dream. Look at this. Verse 10. Again, this is 20 years ago. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, behold, the Lord stood above it all and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. That's a reiteration of the promise that he made to Abraham and to Isaac. He's now making it to Jacob. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There it is again and again and again. Behold, I am with you. So you feel alone. You're in the middle of the wilderness. You're using a rock for a pillow. Look at you're going to an unknown land, at least as far as you are concerned. I'm going to go with you. And will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I've done all that I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep. Look what he said. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. So he thinks he's in the middle of nowhere. He's in this position where he doesn't have anything. He's afraid. God meets him in this space in such a powerful way. He wakes up and, and goes, this place is special. It rocks him. It's a sort of a historical, maybe, moment for him. A life-altering moment. One that he would often look back on. And then look at his response. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He, he, he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. So he renames the place Bethel, which means house of God which has already come up. How awesome is this place, he says. Then Jacob made a vow. Here it is. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I can come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God and this stone which I have set up for a pillar should be, shall be God's house and of all that you give me, I will give you a full tenth. So the argument goes that he should have gone and should have returned to Bethel according to his vow. He set up a stone there. This is the house of God. This place is special. If I'm coming back to the land, where am I going? I'm going back here. Now, it's not explicit in the text. He doesn't make a vow that he'd return to Bethel. Technically, he is in the promised land at Shechem, only just... So it does, it's not an explicit command, but I think it's worth suggesting that maybe for him he's settling. He's, he's, he's kind of just good enough on the vow. And he goes to Shechem instead of Bethel. Now, merit for that particular argument is added when you consider the content of chapter 34. And then in chapter 35, the very first verse, God says, Arise and go to Bethel. Suggests, why didn't you go to Bethel before? Instead, you went to Shechem. And now we have chapter 34. So why Shechem then? Okay, I'm going to nerd out for just a second, if that's okay. Um, it could be. Hear me, it's not definitive. It can't make an argument explicitly in Scripture. It could be that there is a connection between Jacob and Lot right here. Now, it goes back a long way, so we won't go all the way back there. But if you remember Lot, this is Abraham's nephew. He was with Abraham when he left Haran initially. 
And then they were growing in wealth because, again, Lot was being blessed because he had proximity to Abraham. We've talked about that's a picture of God blessing all the families of the earth because of his promise to bless Abraham. So we're getting a picture of those in proximity to Abraham. They're getting blessed. But then they got blessed to the point where they couldn't dwell in the same place. And so they had to part ways. And it says that Lot, this is Genesis chapter 13, Lot set his sights on the Jordan Valley, which is where Sodom is. And then he pitched his tents near or as far as Sodom. And the wording is somewhat similar here when it says that Jacob himself pitched his tents before Shechem. So he's attracted to the city for some reason and decides to settle there instead of going to Bethel. Lot wouldn't have needed rescuing had he not set his eyes on Sodom. And what happens today wouldn't happen, wouldn't have happened if Jacob had not settled in Shechem but continued on to Bethel. That's the argument. And I think it has some merit. I don't think it's definitive, but I think it has some merit. And here it sets up chapter 34 and verse 19. 33 verse 19. And the sons of Hamor... Shechem's father, uh, he bought, and from, excuse me, he bought for a hundred pieces of money some land. Okay, so he's going to stay there for a while. And there he erected an altar. There was already, an, he already erected an altar 20 years ago in Bethel. You're going to set up an altar here now. One scholar, uh, Kent Hughes, referred to this as halfway obedience. It's not directly disobedient, but it certainly doesn't feel faithful. Jacob is doing his own thing, and it's not the first time we've seen this with the patriarchs. Abraham and and Isaac had done it too, where they just kind of do things their own way. Yeah, God made us this promise, but maybe he meant for us to do this. And they would do their own thing and just made mess after mess after mess. And that's certainly the case today. Here we go. Chapter 34, verse 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. Uh, there's, the, there's the context. There's a couple of things of note here. First, by way of a question. What do you think it was like to be the, the daughter, really the only daughter of record, the daughter of Jacob's least favorite wife. Okay, remember, so Dinah is the daughter of Leah. Leah, Jacob didn't love Leah. He loved her little sister. But because her, her dad didn't want the younger one to get married before the older one tricked Jacob into thinking he was marrying Rachel, but she, he married Leah instead, and he didn't find out till the morning. And then he's like, what? And then he comes back, and then they make a deal for Rachel. Then he ends up with Rachel, and clearly he favors Rachel. That is clear through their whole story. Even last week when we looked at how he lined up his kids, and what are, what are good um, sort of uh, manageable or expendable losses <laughs> because he's afraid of his brother coming to attack him. So he lines up his families in, family in order of favor with his servants and their children way out ahead, with Leah and her children out ahead, then Rachel and Joseph. And the, I mean, it's just sick. We're going to continue to see more of that favoritism uh, starting really in chapter 37. There's some deep animosity with the kids among all the kids, and there are many, because he clearly pay, plays favorites. So what do you think it was like to be um, the only daughter of record in in Jacob's house? And your mom is Leah, the least favored wife. We don't have anything too explicit, and we can draw some connections to this story and kind of imagine what it was like. We understand social and familial sort of uh, connection, how it works. Secondly, of note... When it says, went out to see the women of the land or be seen by the women of the land, which is interesting. So she's presenting herself to some degree. Historians mention that young women of marriable age, like you're old enough to be married, and she's probably about 15 or 16 here, um, which means that 
some time has elapsed between the incident with Esau because she was a little kid by that. The, ch the children were at a tender age. That's a way of saying they're little. And they were of tender age when they were meeting Esau. So there's probably a decade that's gone by and she's now about 15 or 16. That's the math. It's rough math, but that's the math. So she's presenting herself in a sense. But here's the thing. If you were of marriable age as a young woman, you would not be allowed to leave the camp unattended. That's just customary. And she's doing this on her own. That can only mean a couple of things. And the, it, well, it could mean, I suppose, that Jacob didn't have any of those kinds of rules, even though it was customary. I mean, we, we can make an argument that he didn't really care for Leah's kids, so he doesn't care what they do. So you could maybe make that argument. He doesn't care what Dinah does. So there are no rules like that. And she's not restrained by any of those staying in the tents unless a chaperone is with you. That could be. That could be, but I would, I would push on it because if you remember Jacob's brother Esau, Esau went out and married a couple of women from Canaan. It made their parents, Isaac and Rebekah, really angry, made life bitter for them, it says. So he's already got his own examples of what it's like to sort of intermarry with people in the land. So he would even have his own reasons to say, stay close to home. Even if he didn't care for her, he doesn't want that kind of... So I don't, I don't necessarily buy that. I think... What's happening here is she's sneaking out. Yeah, that's not hard to buy. When you, when, when you live in that kind of environment and you are neglected by a father, particularly young women, it's sneaking out. In fact, what's translated as went out in the Hebrew actually suggests unwholesomeness. So she's, she's out doing what she shouldn't be doing. And I would venture guess Jacob doesn't know she's out. And I would also guess that Leah probably doesn't know she's out either. It's a tragic story. And it's more examples of some of the dysfunction we've already talked about within the family. And this is the patriarchal family. So again, if this is propaganda, if you're just trying to manipulate people, you, you tend to want to put your founders in pretty good light. Yeah, we don't have a lot of good light. No, we actually do have a lot of good light, which is why we're able to see how bad they are. Okay. Look at this. Verse 2. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. There is no guessing as to what just happened. Okay, Scripture is clear. We're not like, well, what exactly happened? Was it real? It's clear. There's some strong verbs in this sentence. He saw her. He seized her. He raped her. And in so doing, humiliated her. And the reader doesn't know it yet. We'll know in verse 26 explicitly. But he keeps her. By the end of the narrative, we find out that she's been in Shechem's house this whole time. So he does this, and he keeps her. I'm going to use the word abducts, even though Scripture doesn't. He forcefully keeps her. So he saw her, he seized her, he raped her, he humiliated her, and I'm going to add, he kept her. This poor little girl. Verse 3. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tender, tenderly to her. I wish you treated her tenderly too. See, this is confusing to me because we're going to use language of love in this section. I love her. His soul is drawn to her. I'm not sure what this kid knows what that is like. Does he know the difference between just wanting lust that would lead you to seize, to, to rape, and to humiliate. And now you're going to speak tender words to her? This kid's the, the prince of the land. Look, look at verse 4. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Give me this girl for my wife. He's used to getting what he wants, clearly. He's a piece of work. And sadly, it's not the only piece of work in this story. Look at verse 5. Now Jacob 
heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah. Now, we know from verse 26 that he didn't hear that from Dinah. She's not home, which means words getting out. He heard. And he didn't just hear hear that, what what, what is she? Why is she? He, He heard that she's been defiled. Okay, so the the gossip is spreading, and he heard. But his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And this sets the tone for Jacob, just about as passive as they come. He acts when he is threatened or he can gain something. He's hard to like. Hughes actually said it. I'm glad he did. Hughes in his commentary actually said it. Well, he didn't say it. He wrote it. But he said it out loud. He just said this. Gave this personal note in a technical work. He said, personally, I have not found Jacob likable. And I'm like, I'm glad you said that. He says, though at times he has been admirable. We have moments with Jacob where there are moments of faith that we we can admire if we're going to take the story as a whole, ah, this guy's hard. It makes sense that he's going to wrestle all night with God. He's always grabbing at heels. His name, meaning he who grabs at the heels, his brother takes advantage. He's deceitful. He's, he's a cheater. He only acts when it benefits him or protects his own hide. He lines up his kids in order of his faith. Like, this guy's a piece of work, too. And he just heard his daughter has been defiled, and we know that she's being kept and he does nothing but waits for his sons to come in out of the field again scripture does not dress up the patriarchs Abraham and Isaac alike one minute they're just, they're demonstrating just great faith admirable faith where you'd be like man that's That's awesome. And then the next, they're lying to gain advantage. And you remember when both Abraham and Isaac lied to gain advantage? Who did they put at risk? Their wives. Multiple times. In a ruse to gain. They put their wives at risk. And here we have Jacob clearly interested in gain, as you'll see later. At least it suggests that later and now his his daughter's at risk because he put his pitched his tent near Shechem for advantage okay Jacob is really no different than Abraham and Isaac only I would argue he's worse he's 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 worse This is going to support my opening point that Jesus didn't come to save the dressed up Instagram ready version of you. He came for the real you because these are the founders. Jesus knew exactly what it was going to cost him. God knew exactly what it was going to cost him to redeem his people. That's why this does not surprise him and he keeps keeps his covenant regardless because he knew that already. It's a bummer. Now I'm going to be, get uncomfortable for just a second particularly for the men in the room and those especially who have daughters. It's almost become anecdotal in our country, in our culture, to speak of defending our daughters in sort of this weird macho sort of bravado. You know, you, you see the, 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 in the movies, you see the guy coming to take the daughter out on a date or to ask for blessing to marry his daughter. And you've always got the, the, the stereotypical sort of shotgun scene where he's cleaning a shotgun at the kitchen table or you know there's there's and I've heard I've heard I've done it many many times I've got daughters this talk man if anybody messes with my daughter and we talk big you know what I do and we start talking about how sharp the knife is and where we're going to use it like that kind of stuff we do that it's it's anecdotal culturally for us we almost value it like that's synonymous with what it means to be a good dad But I want you to know and clearly hear in Scripture, Scripture does not honor that at all. It's become very apparent in this story. I was 
I didn't know when to go to Genesis chapter 49. We'll do it now. It's going to seem a little weird because we haven't looked at the story first. But let's look at the judgment on what happens and then take that judgment with us into the story. So look at 49. This is how Moses, this is how the narrator, this is how Scripture records what Simeon and Levi are about to do in Genesis chapter 34. Look at this. 49 verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel, O oh, oh my glory. Be not joined to their company, for in their anger they killed men. And in their willingness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it, w- it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel." It's in a, 49, chapter 49 is an indictment on what's about to happen. So again, I'm sitting here torn because I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the passivity of Jacob. Jacob hears his, water's been defiled, his daughter's been defiled and he does nothing. The brothers come back from the field. They get all worked up and we're about to see what they're going to do and that gets condemned. So I'm like, what is a godly father supposed to do? See that? And look at I can't answer that question for you. But that's the tension this text invites a little bit. Because there is hardly a person in here that does rightly. It's hard. It's hard. Turns out there is, in all of Scripture, there is but one hero. I'll give you one guess. Jesus. There's one hero. Okay, well, let's keep going. Oh, yeah, let's keep going. Um, verse 6. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. This is such a bizarre scene. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it. So they're, they're ready to act now. There's something Jacob wasn't ready to do. And the men were indignant and very angry. Because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. Notice she's not called Dinah. Can we just stop for a second and recognize how many times Dinah is referred to as Jacob's daughter in this passage and he does nothing. And then when he does act, he acts on his own behalf. It's, it's ridiculous. It's disappointing at best. But scripture records it here. What Shechem did was absolutely wrong. And maybe even their anger that it was done is right. But what they do in that anger, what does Scripture say? In your anger, do not sin. What they do in their anger is not justifiable. That's the idea. But the anger is right. It's hard. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourself. You shall dwell with us. The land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Then Shechem has a couple of words. He's going to add to his father's argument. He's going to add, uh, let me f- find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask for me as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me. Those are kind of, kind of standardized bride prices in that culture. So he's saying, above and beyond, I'll go. Ask for whatever, seriously. Not just the customary bride price. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Okay, let's stop for a second. God made Jacob and Isaac and Abraham some pretty extravagant promises, did he not? What were those promises? Well, they're repeated, but if we were to summarize what those promises are, they are promises of land. They're promises of blessing, offspring, and that blessing being in, in some ways fulfilled in wealth and prosperity, but also being a blessing that through them would bless all the families of the earth. So that blessing is to extend to others through you, which means you've got to have it first. And, okay. So, 
promises of land, promises of offspring like the dust of the earth and you're going to spread to the north, south, east, west like it's going to be big. You're going to be a father of, a big, uh, of many nations. Okay, these are the promises. I wonder if Jacob sat back at all and spent any time considering this deal. Because what's in it? A land, prosperity, and with marriage alliances, the suggestion of offspring. I wonder if this is another example of all the times we thought, here are the promises God made. Maybe he meant that we do this. And Abraham would do his own thing. And Isaac would do his own thing. Thinking that, well, it's in line. It fits. I wonder if Jacob's sitting here going, you know, it's not good what happened to her, but this could work out well. God did bless us with land. He did say that we would have prosperity, and he did say we'd be father of many nations. This would su- See that? Now, he isn't given time to consider an answer, and we pro- it's probably good at least in part, because I'm not sure we'd like the answer he would have given. But his sons don't give him any time. Look at verse 13. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully. <laughs> Okay, I got that highlighted because deceitfully, I think, is intentional. What does Jacob's name mean? He grabs by the heel. He cheats. Esau said when he was tricked out of his birthright, he said, isn't Jacob rightly named Esau for he has deceived me these now two times? Okay, turns out the apple doesn't fall that far from the tree. And these guys are scheming too. They're grabbing at heels too. They're cheating too. And this is ugly. They answered Hamor and Shechem deceitfully. Because he had defiled their sister Dinah. And they said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell in the land with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter. Okay, there it is implicitly. We will take our daughter, which means that she's not with you. So, and we will be gone. This goes back to the covenant of circumcision in chapter 17. I'm not going to go back there. You can go read it. Covenant of circumcision, just in brief, was this. It It was a physical sign in the male body associated with what would produce offspring, because it's representative of the covenant. This is the promise I made. You're going to be a father of many nations. You're going to have land, seed, and blessing. That was the, that's the whole thing. And the sign of the covenant was the circumcision in all men eight days old and older were to be circumcised as a sign to everyone else that they were a distinct people, a separate people, and in and through them God intends to bless all the families of the earth. But right now they are this distinct family identified in this particular way. Okay, that's as much as I'll say about that. So in Deuteronomy chapter 7, later uh, in the law, it will actually forbid the people of God to, to intermarry with other nations. It'll forbid it. Don't marry the other nations in Canaan. Now, let, let, let me, we need to say this because these passages in the Old Testament have been really misused culturally today. This has nothing to do with people of different ethnicities marrying. These verses have been weaponized to say that you should marry within your own race. Okay, that's just, that's ridiculous and and, 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 and antithetical really to the storyline of Scripture. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with not putting the covenant at risk. Let me, let me, maybe this helps. I think a New Testament equivalent would be this, of those Old Testament laws. A New Testament equivalent would be this. As a believer, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. That, I think, carries the idea of the Old Testament sentiment of do not marry the women from other nations. It's not about whether or not people of different ethnicities can marry. Ah, it's not. It's about we do not put the covenant at at risk. God says the same thing. Like, if you're a believer, don't marry someone who's not a believer because it's going to divide your household. It's going to put covenant at risk. See that? That's what it's about. So let's, let, let's, be, let's be clear. Okay. So in a sense, what Dinah's brothers suggest here seems reasonable. Look, we can't do this thing because we are distinct. 
We were a distinct people, and it would, it would not be good. It would be a disgrace to us to give our daughters to you and have your daughters marry some of our sons. That would be a disgrace because you have not been circumcised. So in a sense, you go, okay, that's reasonable, <laughs> except it's insincere. They're not concerned about the disgrace or defiling covenant. This is all a ruse to gain control and to execute revenge which is a good example of something that has happened historically repeatedly in the name of God, in the name of the church, that is just em- embarrassing. Okay? These, two, these, these boys are taking the sign of a covenant, something sacred that God instituted between him and his covenant people, and they're weaponizing it for their own anger and rage Okay, we've, we've done that historically. The church has done that historically. We've taken sacred things, and in the name of God, we've committed genocide in the name of God. That's, a, that's what is about to happen, is genocide on terms of the sacred. Okay. Um, we, we've, we've got to, as, as a people, stop... Um, defending the patriarchs or excusing the things that they do. It's in Scripture, and it has something beautiful to tell us in regards to what Jesus has accomplished for us. But if, you, if we dumb this, these texts down to try to make Jacob look better than he did, well, you know, she shouldn't have snuck out. Well, she, did you see how she was dressed? I mean, she was kind of asking for it. Okay. We've got to stop doing this. We get to tell the truth. Scripture's telling the truth. We should start. You can look at a non-Christian in the eye, a non-believer who is angry because of all the violence in, in the Old Testament, and you can point at Jacob and say, this is your, you can go, totally. Yeah, he's not likable. I agree with you, right? We don't have to go, well stressed and all these things we do to kind of you know, there's a lot on his plate he's got all these kids and can you imagine his household with all those wives and the kids running around like all the, like he was a, we, we just need to stop making excuses we get to look at this story and we get to tell the truth too which I hope invites us to tell the truth about what's going on here as well what's in me Okay, I'm starting to preach a different sermon. Uh, where'd I leave off? Verse 18. Let's keep going. Ooh. The words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem, and the young men did not, the young man did not delay to do the thing. Which I just find just a little bit humorous. Maybe it's comic relief within this text. I cannot wait to be circumcised. Just seems funny to me. I cannot wait to do this. Okay. Because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. There it is again, Jacob's daughter. You know, Moses does not want us to forget who Dinah is. And I wonder, this is, this is reading between the lines a little bit, but in chapter 23, didn't God rename Jacob to Israel? How come Moses doesn't use that name? I don't know. I'm just wondering. Moses is writing Jacob because he's certainly back to his old... Self. I don't know. I'm reading between the lines a little bit. I did it again. Where did I leave off? Now, he was the most honored in all his father's house. Then verse 20. So Hamar and his son Shechem came to the gate of the city and spoke to the men of the city, saying... The gate is where all official business happens. So these guys would gather in the city. Now they've got to convince them because it's not just good enough for Shechem to get circumcised. All the men of Shechem need to be circumcised. <laughs> You're going, hey, there's this woman I really like. So I got, here's what we have to do. Like, what does that have to do with me? So he's got to make an appeal and make a case before the city about how this is going to be advantageous for you as well. They got a big task in front of them. That's why it says he had a lot of influence. He was a man of importance. So people are going to listen to him, but look at what he says. He says, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell on the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. 
Only on this condition will the men to agree to dwell with us and become one people when every male among us is circumcised and as they are circumcised. And then here's where he just kind of te- entices them a little bit, teases them a little bit. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? So Hamar's not just doing it because he, his son's in love. He was like, this can work out. Because if we start these marital alliances, we're, there's more of us. That means they're going to assimilate to us, and we're only going to be that much more powerful. And everything they have will belong to us. And it causes the men of the city to go, all right. They're not doing this for, for Shechem. They're not doing this for the kid who's in love. They're in. They're in. And all who went out to the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised. All went out who went out to the gate of the city. So all the pr- men of prominence did this thing. Okay. Simeon and Levi bided their time. Look at this. On the third day, when they were sore. Okay, they didn't have frozen peas back then. (laughs) On the third day, when they were sore. That means Simeon and Levi are waiting. Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, their mom is Leah too, so these are full brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house. There's where we know explicitly that she has not been in their possession. So they took her. Okay. The sons of Jacob came. Look at this. It doesn't stop there. There, There's something about this like, okay, your daughter, your sister, in this case, your sister was taken, she was defiled, she was humiliated, and she was kept. Finding that tension between the passivity of Jacob and the violence that we're seeing with them, it's like, where do you go? How do you go and just get your sister back and some appropriate justice? But man, if they did not just go, just become blood crazed and commit genocide. They wipe out everyone. Look at this. 27. They didn't stop there with just rescuing their sister. The sons of Jacob came came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. Man, we can take something that you did wrong and we can use that to justify wrong. And when people question, yeah, but, and we point somewhere else. That's what's happening here. That's the economy. They're justifying now, ironically, the same kind of behavior that they've experienced. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field. All their wealth, all their little ones, all their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. Now, The other guys were just scheming, saying, won't their stuff become ours? Won't all that they are become ours? And what happens? And in this revenge, they end up taking all of Shechem as their own. Taking the little ones and their moms. Like, you just rescued your sister and in the same moment imprisoned all the other little girls and, 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 and took away all the other wives. See the irony? Yeah, but... Yeah, really good at justifying when wrong has been done to us. And that's certainly the case here. And then verse 30. Here's Jacob's response. Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land. They're not going to think highly of me anymore. Now I'm going to have a bad reputation. Look at this. Uh, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, Perizzites, my numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my, my household. It's the same thing we've only ever seen from him. He's willing to act when he's under threat. Remember Esau, his brother, and the 400 men, and he's lining all his kids up trying to protect himself? Like, it's the same thing here. He has no army. He knows that if somebody comes against him, he's going to lose I just want to ask him, hey, Jacob, how's your daughter? 
as your daughter. Because she's just now home. And you're more concerned about how you smell to the inhabitants of the land. No one acts rightly here. We see glimpses of it, but I mean, even their response. Should, should he have treated, they said to him, they were indignant back, and they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? You're like, man, this is... The closest thing to any concern for Dinah, I think, in this text. Because what's the answer to the question, should our sister be treated like a prostitute? What's the answer? No, she should not be treated that way. That's the answer. This is the closest thing we get to concern. But it's clouded by their excessive violence, their plundering, and ironically, the capturing of all the other women. And what's Jacob doing? Jacob is just surviving like he's so often done. This story is hard. And I'm sorry to say, it's not the last one. The Bible is full of hard stories. So when Scripture says in Romans chapter 3, verse 12, that no one does good, not even one, it's not kidding. It continues in Romans 3 and says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is not an exaggeration when it says all have sinned. When you're like, well, not everyone. I mean, no, I know there's some sinners out there, but I'm a good person. No, no, no. It's not exaggerating. There is no one good, not one. Which version of you did Jesus come to save? The Instagram-ready version of you or the real one? See that? God knew exactly what he was doing when he promised that Jesus would come. He knew exactly who you were, who I was. It's why these stories can happen and God can continue to keep his promises because he made the promise in view of this. He promised to come when he knew our worst. And he continues to keep the promise because the promise isn't contingent upon Jacob, it's contingent upon Jesus who is identified in Scripture as the true Israel. Oh, interesting. So he's the new Jacob. Uh Uh-huh. Oh. You mean the one who shows up when Jacob didn't? Yeah. You you mean the one who acted when Jacob didn't? Yeah. Oh. See, God didn't go, I don't know about this whole thing. No, he knew exactly who we were when he determined to bless all the families of the earth through Abraham. And that through Abraham, in part, had something to do with what Abraham would bring to the culture around him, sure, But it's primarily about who would one day be born of Abraham, offspring singular. That's Jesus. And through Jesus, all the families of the earth, including Abraham, is going to be saved. That's what it's about. And that's why God can continue when it's ugly. And that's why Scripture can tell the truth. And listen to me. That's why you can. You don't have to dress yourself up first to come to Jesus. He already knows who you are. he knew when Adam and Eve ate the fruit he knew what he would have to do to redeem us and he knew what it would cost him and he made the decision to do it when we looked our worst because he already was aware of it (laughs) These stories didn't surprise him like he made a deal in Genesis 3.15. Okay, this is how we'll do it, but you guys got to be good. And then they keep like not being good. And he's like, I don't know if this is going to work. I keep trying and they keep screwing up. No, because it wasn't. It, it, the gospel is not true because we somehow did something right. The gospel is true because Jesus did. And God had full confidence in him to bring about the redemption he sought after. Because what did he say? He looked at the world. He looked at the real world. In John 3, 16, he said, God so loved the world. He, lo- he, had, the, he had the real world in view. It wasn't some Instagram-ready version. And Hebrews 12 says that, he, that Jesus was glad to help. That God sent his son to die, and Jesus was glad to do it. Hebrews 12, 2. Considered it a joy, actually, it says. 
I'm going to say it again. Scripture does not romanticize, neither does it sentimentalize the cross of Christ. It is as real and bloody as the mess Jesus stepped into, justly proportionate. I hope amidst this ugly, which I hope affords you an opportunity to look at the ugly and tell the truth about your own heart. I hope in all of this ugly, what you hear this morning is a very real invitation to come to the cross of Christ for it is sufficient. Because God knew exactly who we were and knew exactly what it would cost and it was justly proportionate, which means, as Paul says, that, that God's grace is sufficient for us. It's enough. It's robust. Strong and healthy. Able to withstand and overcome. It's robust. So I hope you get the permission to bring the real you to the table this morning. It's easy to dress up and get Instagram ready for church. I know. And I'm not just talking about the clothes we wear. I'm talking about the lives we live and what we believe about ourselves. We get to come into this place. This is the awesome thing about the church. We get to come into this place and we get to tell the truth. <sighs> the lie is exhausting. We get to tell the truth. And Jesus is glad to meet us in that space. Let's stand together. Mm -hmm.